everybody. Welcome to the October Pen Parentis Literary Salon. Here we are in New York City. We are uh, uptown and downtown, and uh, we are very excited to have three authors that are from all over the country. We have one from Colorado and one from Indiana and one from just outside of New York City. So we're pretty, we're like, we're making the best of what we can, what we have here on the Zoom. So we're really, really glad you're all out here. Please uh, drop into the comments where you're from and you know where you're watching from, so that we would know because we can actually talk to you. And during the course of this um, live stream, it would be great if you would ask your questions. Make sure you drop likes. Uh, I sound like a YouTuber. Drop likes, but um, really do that because we can see it. So we and we want to know that you're watching. So um, let us know. See, Chicago, Toronto, this is really exciting. Um, and it looks like there is a small problem with Facebook. So hopefully that will fix itself. Um, and so my name is M.M. DeVoe. I am the founder of Pen Parentis, and I am the downtowner. And uh, I wrote a book called Book and Baby, which is to help writers like you guys uh, stay creative while, while your kids are growing up. And uh, my partner here is Christina Chu, and she has a book out called Beauty, which is a novel, and it is a fantastic prize-winning novel. Actually, we're both prize winners. She won the 2020 Best Book uh, of Kirkus, right? And I won uh, first prize in the Indie Writing Award. So woohoo, you're so lucky. <laughs> Christina, why don't you introduce our authors for tonight? So tonight, our, um, our theme is Searching for Safety. And we have three authors. We have Maya Shambhag Lang. Um, she's the author of What We Carry, named a New York Times book review editor's choice and an Amazon best book of 2020. Yay! And we have Tommy Dean. He's the author of two flash fiction chapbooks, Special Like the People on TV and Covenants. He lives in Indiana with his wife and two children. Hello, Tommy. Um, and we finally have Andrew Altschul, and he's the author of The Gringa. It's a finalist for the 2021 Colorado Book Award. His previous novels include Lady Lazarus and Deus Ex Machina. Deus Ex Machina. Yes. Everyone, please welcome our authors. Hello. Yay! Round and, of applause. <laughs> around. And um, our first reader tonight will be Tommy Dean. Don't go anywhere because we're going to, after all the readings, we're going to talk back and all the things. So stay with us, my friends. Tommy okay. Dean. Thank Tommy. you so much Yay. for uh, yeah for having me. I'm going to read uh, something quick. Uh, Tommy, can you let hear me, me? Let me? Let me read your full bio so everyone knew, knows everything about you. How's that? Sure. Sounds good. Okay. Uh, Tommy Dean is the author of two flash fiction chapbooks, special like the people on TV and Covenants. Um, he's the editor of Fractured Lit and Uncharted Magazine, a graduate of Queens University of Charlotte MFA program. He's currently working on a novel, a recipient of the 2019 Lasso Prize in Short Fiction. His writing can be found in Best Microfiction 2019 and 2020. Best Small Fiction 2019, Monkey Bicycle, New World Writing, Pithead Chapel, and New Flash Fiction Review. He taught writing workshops for Gotham and the Barrel House Conversations and Connections Conference, as well as the Lafayette Writers Workshop. Everyone, please welcome Tommy Dean. Okay, thank you so much. All right, I'm going to read um, a quick flash uh, that was published in uh, Macro Mike. Uh, it's called A Parallel Universe of Unmatched Anger. My son held up his wrist, tapped the empty rectangle where the digital numbers used to blink. 12, 12, 12. I tried to sit at once, but Jackson, five, had complained that it never moved. His eyes darted from the afternoon shadow morphing on the wall to the pile of plastic blocks at his feet to the sound of his mother opening a package in the kitchen. When I pointed out the movement from 340 to 341, he cried, tears welling up under his eyelashes. I, I want it to move all the time, he said, just like me. And he wiggled like an upright worm, his body a constant flash. I was bad at forecasting his movements, knowing when to get out of the way, when to trail behind, when to block him from the worst of his impulses. The blinking, I asked? 
But that's not real time, bud. He hit his wrist in his armpit and shook his head. I prepared myself for another battle I wouldn't win. Probably didn't need to win, but so little had gone right in those weeks. I wished I could cry too, but there was an anger that always held me back. I hadn't cried in years. In those years waiting for my own father to explode at night. Give it here, I said. I stood over him, hand out, my own wrist flexed. I was already feeling ridiculous, the shape of the demanding father, when he darted through the playroom door and into the kitchen, slamming into his mother's leg as she turned, bowl of cereal flipping from her hand, crashing to the floor. The milk ran like melted ice cream across the bubbled linoleum floor. Jake, leave it, she said. He needs to learn, I said, twisting past her, careful to step over the bits of cereal. Even angry, I wouldn't track the mess all over the house. His feet, light but graceful, like a frog traveling across lily pads. Jackson scaled the stairs and rushed through the narrow hallway and into his room. A fleeting thought of wonder if this was who I wanted to be, the 32nd version of that shadowed man on that chart of evolution. How many generations of angry fathers were caught in this exact moment? A parallel universe of unmatched anger. My own steps were labored, arthritis at my age, an unplanned crack creeping invisibly across the foundation of my body. Kids run while adults lurch and then totter. My anger in those years, especially when I didn't know it, was always about aging, my own clock blinking. Medications taken to dull the pain like kindling to a fire of disappointment. I stood in the doorway while Jackson burrowed under the comforter on his bed, the blanket twitching. My heart rate commanding I do something. The swell of pounding in my ears, refusing to abate. Surrounded across the floor were action figures, guns, and swords at the ready. Faces twisted in menace, propped up by the walls of Legos. Stuffed animals, turtles, and hedgehogs flipped over, bellies exposed, at the mercy of this miniature war that surrounded them. My son was encased in the shell of his comforter, and I couldn't go through with it. I wanted it to be my grandfather's watch, the one I hid underneath my comforter at night, trying to time my breathing with a thud of each tick, wondering if my heart would keep beating, hoping the house would remain silent, that my vigilance would keep us all safe from the uproar of potential violence. But one night, early in my marriage, fired from a job that no longer felt like the right identity, I'd sold the watch at a pawn shop, secure in the thought of reclaiming it before it was lost to the next desperate buyer. My attempts at teaching respect and discipline were the impulses of fear, a grasping of control in a mercurial world, one where the blinking of the clock had more potential than the constant onslaught of time. When I sat on the bed and put my hand on his back, he twitched. We sat there until he felt safe enough to pop his head out, offering me his wrist. We don't have to change, I said. We don't have to change a thing. Kids are adaptable to our whims, our fears, our entitlements. He gave me so many chances to change him, and so few of those opportunities did I resist. Good, he said, because I want to keep blinking. Thank you. Yay! Wow, that was wonderful. Excellent. So tell us about Flash. You have uh, a universe in one page. Yeah. Um, you know, I like to take these moments like this, these tiny moments of these characters' lives. Um, I may never write about this character again um these are their their one shot in my my fictional world um and hopefully i've given you everything you need to know about them in, in this one moment um i also like to hopefully have a yeah have a swell from from highs to lows and uh some kind of feeling at the end i want you to feel something great we love the arc like Thank even you. in like this much room yeah and generations in this yes. Time. Yeah. And generations. In fact, I struggled with this story until I read a Sarah Freely um, poem and I can't remember what the name of it was, but it gave me the idea of adding that, that third generation, that, that father's watch. So not just generations, wow. but also the endless, endless generations of fathers. Yeah. yeah. In the world. Oof, yeah. It feels like a lot of pressure. You know, you know. Tommy, sometimes, um, People think that short, you know, shorts take very little time because it's short. Can you can you actually talk a little bit about this? I mean, 
it yeah. can take a long time. It can take longer it, sometimes. It can. Yeah, absolutely. I think sometimes stories do come out whole in short amount of times, just depending on if you get the first line right, if you get the arc right. This one, though, I struggled with. Um, it felt very much like a vignette of just kind of taken from my life. I needed, like I said, I needed that inspiration from from that that poem by Sarah Fraley. I needed that other watch. Um, yeah. And so sometimes, yeah, you, you're really searching for the images that help you dig deeper into the characters. So it's not as surface level or conventional. Because um, without those, without that other watch, I feel like this is just, you know, me chasing after my son, which I'm <laughs> sure I've done many times um, and, and probably not always as nicely uh, ended uh, as it is in the story as well. Um, but yeah, I think we can make the mistake of thinking if it's short that it can just be, it can be completed. Now, I, I mean, I have written things that have been mostly complete in a very short amount of time, but sometimes you struggle like, like anything else um, to complete it. Yeah, uh, I love the um, the generational like handing down that anger. And that really resonated for me because um, I came from a very angry family, like my father in particular, and I had to. It was really hard for me to relearn how to be a parent and not do that. Um, so that story really resonated with me. Oh yeah. Thank you. I mean, unfortunately that it did. Right. But, but hopefully, yeah, it felt honest and, and truthful. Um, and I think even in the best of situations where we're as parents, we're always trying to check um, some of our, our desires of, of, of these perfect events, um, you know, where the kid doesn't run away and they listen and they don't run into the mom and they don't make messes. Um, and, and how we have to kind of check ourselves, uh, yeah, exactly. especially depending on what our models were as, as kids ourselves. You're getting a lot of feedback, good feedback from the audience. Lisa and Kay and Helen and Ananda and Helene all are saying how wonderful it is. And they're just letting you know. Well, thank if you're you not so seeing much. the comments, we yeah. are. <laughs> okay, well, I'm not seeing them, but I appreciate it. They're there. It. You'll see them when you, okay. when you end up in the side. Um, while, just for a second, I want to, yeah, while we switch around to the next reader, I want to quickly uh, give a shout out to our, some of our sponsors. All Good Works gave us a grant to, do, to have office space, which is a really nice thing of them to do. Um, and then I wanted to thank Lisa Walker, Michaela Barnes, uh, and LMHQ for uh, funding us a little bit. So, you know, yay, thank you guys. Um, who is next, Christina? Our next author is Maya Shanba Glan. Um, she's the author of What We Carry, um, and she's also the author of The 16th of June. It was long listed for the Center for Fiction First Novel Prize and named a must read novel by CBS and In Style. Her essays have appeared in New York Magazine, The Washington Post, Times of India, and her work has been anthologized. Lang lives in New York and is a single parent. Everyone, please welcome Maya Lang. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. And um, it was great getting to hear that flash piece, uh, which resonated with me. I often tell my students that like novels can be like, when you're building a novel, it's sort of like a Victorian house in that it's forgiving. You have lots of room to play with, but short stories and flash fiction are like micro studio apartments where so much rests on every, you know, the real estate is so precious that it can be a lot less forgiving. Um, okay, so I thought I would read a very brief excerpt from what we carry. I'm always so bad at getting the book into the camera. <laughs> Um, and I normally don't read this excerpt, but because of our forum tonight, I thought this one might speak to people. This is about when I was caring for my mother while also caring for my very young daughter. Um, I am brushing my daughter's hair one morning while she tries to squirm out from under me. I hear myself say, you should be glad. Grandma never used to brush my hair. Lucky you, my daughter mutters. <laughs> I smile, but it occurs to me that she is right. I brush her hair for my sake. I don't want her to be bullied or to be looked at with pity by her teachers the way I was as a girl, the only South Asian girl in my grade. 
Those are my fears though. And what seems a maternal act is at heart a selfish one. I remember years ago when my mother would visit me in college, her car loaded up with strange offerings. I knew it was a gesture of love, but those items felt like they had nothing to do with me at all. Paper towels, Claritin, wide spectrum antibiotics, a two pound tub of cookies. She was like a traveling representative from Costco. <laughs> the items reminded me of the ones we used to pack in a Samsonite suitcase to bring to India. Her parents had a comfortable life, but they didn't have ready access to Western conveniences. Maybe my mother brought me items she wished someone had brought her. Maybe I brush my daughter's hair because I wish someone had done that for me. Maybe at our most maternal, we aren't mothers at all. We're daughters reaching back in time for the mothers we wish we had and finding ourselves. Caretaking offers a chance to atone. My mother didn't drop everything for me when I needed her as a child, but I drop everything for her now. It feels like a do-over, a chance to get things right between us. I'm being the mother she should have been. In doing so, I feel I'm helping us both. We forget, I think, in the act of caring, who is being cared for, that it is not our own hair getting brushed, our own mouths being fed, our own needs being met. We do what wasn't done for us. We hope it will be enough. Thank you. Wow, that was so beautiful. Yay! That was amazing. More generational. This is, <laughs> this is the mom side. <laughs> yeah, how perfect did that end up? That was like cool. It was like a little book ending. Yeah. <laughs> I, I really love that whole idea of healing the relationship um, and taking responsibility for it even though like it, it's so easy to be like to say it, it she should have done it right like it was really her job but to take that and 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 heal it it's amazing it's it was so beautifully written thank you you know it's funny i once heard zadie smith say that being a parent is like encountering yourself in a dark alley mm -hmm. um and I think it's true, not only in that we kind of see ourselves reflected in our children, but also the act of parenthood, I think, makes us re-encounter ourselves, where we have these moments where we think like, you know, there's like this uncanny flashback to childhood because something will be happening and we'll think, wait, I remember how my parents handled this. And in retrospect, like that was a little crazy or that was not right or you know, I, I process it differently now and I would never do that to my child. So I remember the first time I apologized to my daughter over something oh, man. and I, I knew it was the right thing to do, but like the Greek chorus in my head was going <laughs> bonkers because I was like, my oh, Asian yeah, parents yeah. never would have apologized to me. And it was really this moment of like, kind of, okay, I'm going to do this because I know it's the right thing to do and that I absolutely should do this, but I'm absolutely breaking with like how I was raised and like probably, you know, thousands of years of like genetic material in, in this act of, and I could tell, I was almost glad that I had like mishandled the situation because I think for my daughter, the moment of apologizing to her, like I could see her sort of light up and be like, oh, like, my, you know, it was like uh, we had entered kind of new territory of like, oh, it's OK to mess up and then you apologize and then you move on. And that interaction mattered more. Like, I don't even remember now the small thing that caused me to, you know, need to apologize. What I do remember is that conversation, which I think was the the necessary and more meaningful one. I, I think, love, I think that's amazing. amazing. Yeah. I love, I love the, uh, the observation. observation you have. Sorry, Sorry, I have an I have um, That's okay. You love the better. Yeah. 
So um, I just really like the observation that you had of being the child wishing to be the mom that you wish you had, that that sort of reflexive on yourself, but also trying to improve uh, your behavior. And okay. everybody on the comments is just, it's beautiful. This book is so brilliant, moving, true, absolutely. And they're quoting you. We, we, we re-encounter ourselves. <laughs> It's really cool. Um, uh, beautiful. Love that Zadie, Zadie Smith quote. Um, yeah, it's very cool. Apologies are the Thank way we teach them to apologize too. Just like here, hang on, let me show you. Uh, here. Apologies are the way we teach them to apologize too. Just like using please ourselves teaches them to say please. Good parenting there, yeah. Maya. <laughs> yeah. Really good yeah. writing. Well, I, I think also um, in general, I, I remember, you know, I my, I never, ever got apologies from adults because I'm, you know, even in, in, you know, not even in my family, but outside of my family. And when I was in high school, I had an English teacher who totally did something really, really horrible to me. And she realized that she did, she would, she messed up and she actually said, you you showed me and i'm really sorry i said that to you wow yeah and it, it can really change the the child and and make them feel so empowered and and just you know make them feel like what what they were doing was justified you know so i think that's so beautiful that you did that oh thank you um yeah I, you know the um French philosopher Jacques Derrida. Um, so I was lucky enough to take classes with him when I was a grad student. And I remember this one seminar. He's like this brilliant man who's also incredibly elegant. You know, he was Parisian, was Parisian and would have like a white scarf and was just like the epitome of... And I remember this one time in seminar, someone asked him a question and he stopped and he said, I don't know. And he was like so cheerful about his lack of, you know, he, he didn't like pretend to have an answer. He was just very cheerfully like, I do not know. And then he turned to the rest of us and he was like, what do you think? Oh. And it was this real eye-opening moment for me where I thought, oh, people who are really comfortable with themselves are so like, free and open to admitting and to just like stepping into the space of being like, I don't know. And far from thinking less of the person, you think more of the person when they're just that open and honest. And it was like a really beautiful, like, and again, I don't remember the question because the question becomes beside the point. Mm -hmm. The real point for me that day was like, it's okay to say, like if Derrida can tell a room full of people that he doesn't know something, I will always do that and so you know it was like that was a moment i'll take with me forever and it taught me so much and that the cheerfulness in addition to the openness was so illuminating it's so nice so nice to have the uplifting like an uplifting i don't know as opposed to a accusatory <laughs> or guilty or well, thank you maya um, we're going to move on to Andrew um, Altschul, and Andrew is the author of Gringa, La um, Lady Lazarus, and Dus Ex Machina. His short fiction and essays have appeared in Esquire, McSweeney's, Plowshares, Hemispheres, Fence, One Story, and other pu publications. Um, it also it, this also includes Best American non-required reading, Best New American Voices, and O. Henry Prize Stories. A former Wallace Stegner Fellow and Jones Lecturer at Stanford, he has also received fellowships from the Breadloaf and Sewanee Writers Conferences, the U Cross Foundation, for the Fundacion Val, how do you pronounce that? Val Valparaiso. Valparaiso and the Rockefeller Foundation Bellagio Center. In 2016, he was the co-author of Writers on Trump, an open letter opposing the Trump campaign that was signed by 
472 writers, including 10 Pulitzer Prize winners. The online petition later garnered nearly 25,000 signatures, and Atschelt is a contributing editor at um, Zizva, Zizva. Zizva, and the director of creative writing at Colorado State University in Fort Collins. Everyone, please welcome Andrew Elchel. Thank you, Christina, and thank you, Am, and, and, and thanks to Penn Perennis for, for inviting me. I've been really looking forward to this event. I'm, I'm still getting my mind around um, Maya's dairy dog <laughs> story, um, and just imagining that I don't know might have been the shortest sentence that that man ever articulated over the course of his career. So <laughs> I wish I could have been there to to hear it um, and, and to study with him, of course. Um, so I, I'm going to read a, a very short uh, excerpt from from the Gringa. And, and like Maya, um, uh, I'm reading something that I have, have actually never read before, but I think in retrospect is, is kind of um, you know, works works with the uh, the organization and the theme tonight. Uh, and just a very quick uh, background: the the Gringa is uh, was loosely inspired by the true story of a, an American woman who was arrested in Lima, Peru, in the 1990s for collaborating with a leftist militant group that had been designated as terrorists by the Peruvian government. And she was convicted of treason and sentenced to life in a military prison. Um, much of uh, the gringa is looking into um, uh, who this person was, trying to understand how uh, uh, how she got to this place um, in Peru, uh, fighting with a, an organization in a country um, that that was not her own. Uh, her, her name's Leonora Gelb, and this section um, it comes at the end of a of a of a chapter about her her adolescence and the sort of slow process of becoming. Um, uh, politically conscious and 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 maybe the beginnings of radicalization and um, she has gone to a concert uh, with her mother and a few friends um, at Giant Stadium in New Jersey back when there was a, a Giant Stadium in New Jersey um, and this was the 1986 Amnesty International uh, Conspiracy of Hope concert that featured. Oh, let's see, Sting and Joni Mitchell and U2 and Ruben Blades and Peter, Paul and Mary. Um, and the headliners were U2. That's who she was really there to see. But but before U2 comes on, she has a kind of um, uh, a, a dispute or, a, or, a, or an argument with a um, someone who's there from Amnesty International who uh, has shown her photographs of Stephen Biko, the uh, youth organizer who was murdered uh, by the South African government in the 70s. Um, she sh he, he's shown her pictures of, of Biko's dead body. And, and shortly after that, she's heard Peter Gabriel play his his famous song, Biko. And she's had this kind of uh, almost almost traumatic kind of um, just, just eye-opening experience about what all this stuff means. So this is on the way home from Giant Stadium. The station wagon sped smoothly over the highway, the interior gloomy and sedate as the lights of commerce played over weary passengers. Leo leaned her cheek to the steamed window and watched car dealerships and carpet stores and office parks flash past. When they stopped at White Castle, she stayed in the car. The smell of what her brother and the others brought back in their grease-thinned paper sacks turned her stomach. She ground her teeth to hold back another inexplicable bout of tears. I'm so pissed they didn't play New Year's Day, Megan said over and over. But they played the other one, Leo's mother said, raising her eyes to the rear view. Bloody Sunday. You like that one, right, Leo? Leo barely heard. When they dropped the other girls at their houses, she grunted in sullen farewell. She would see them soon enough at the swim club or the movies, at high school dances and basement parties and secret forays into Greenwich Village and Herald Square but she would never lose the image of Megan dancing at her seat, waving her cigarette lighter idiotically, singing a name that meant nothing to her. Biko, Biko, Biko. If stone teenagers could sing that name without knowing, if they could join the mindless chorus and claim to care about something to which they would not give another thought until the moment much later when it flattered their sense of themselves to say I was there, then nothing that happened in South Africa or Chile or any of those other places could be said to mean anything here 
inside the bubble. No one was watching. The man was really dead. Here in Cannondale, he had never lived. Quite a day, her mother said when they pulled into the garage. Her brother ran inside, leaving behind a cool silence, only the ticking of the engine and the scent of gasoline through the open window. Are you feeling any better, Leo? I'm feeling fine. Her mother reached back to smooth Leo's hair, and Leo jerked away and felt the tears coming up again. She was furious with herself. She wished she could wrinkle her nose and transport herself to her room without seeing her father or answering his kind and pointless questions, throw herself under the blankets and howl until her throat bled. What's going on with you, Maxine said. What happened with Megan and Rachel? Have you ever heard of Augusto Pinochet? She asked. This was not the point, and Leo knew it, but she had to find a way to give voice to her wretchedness. Her mother drew back. In Chile, of course. Something on her mother's face pushed Leo over the edge. She rocked forward and blubbered helplessly. Then why didn't you tell me? For a minute or more, she sniffed and hiccuped. She could feel her mother looking at her, feel her gaze go from concerned to perplexed to annoyed. She could hear her brother's careless footsteps overhead and the murmur of her father's voice. Leonora, there are a lot of bad people in the world, Maxine said finally. A lot of ugly things happen. Leo looked up in anguish. But why? The killer's smile was fond and unbearable. That's just how it is. Leo closed her eyes. She felt flattened. Her jaw and joints ached. Nobody does anything. That's why. Didn't you just see a million people at that concert? Of course people do something. Do you, Leo said. What do you and dad do? Maxine pressed her lips together and stepped out of the car. The pinging of the door chime filled the garage. Huh? Leo shouted after her. What do you do? Out of sight, her mother said, we live our lives. We try to be good people, raise good children. That's all anyone can do. That's not enough. After a pause, her mother said, I know. The garage door rattled back into motion, thicker gloom descending. She thought her mother had gone inside, but a moment later, her voice came through the dark. Time for bed, Leo. It's been a long day. You can't take things so personally. And then the door closed, leaving Leo in the restless cooling car, listening to a creaking house, the receding footsteps and imperceptible mutters of a family on its way to a good night's sleep. Thanks. Yay! Thank you. <laughs> So Andrew, how did you come upon her story as the story that you were going to actually write a whole novel about? Yeah, um, I'll, I'll try to be brief because it's a, one of those sort of labyrinthine answers. But I was living in Peru in the late 90s for a couple of years, um, not really doing anything um, valuable. I mean, I was sort of a cliched American backpacker who sort of never came home and had, you know, the privilege and a little money in my pocket to just stay in a place that I was fascinated with and loved and had made friends and was learning Spanish. Um, but this was a couple of years after a, uh, an American woman named Lori Berenson, who's from, uh, from New York, a Stuyvesant High School graduate, had been arrested and sentenced um, to life in prison for treason and collaborating with terrorists. And even though, even though it had happened a couple of years ago, it was, it was still in the news all the time. And, and every time it was mentioned, um, people just just kind of went nuts. I mean, she was really like the most hated person in Peru by people on the right, people on the left, um, all across the political spectrum. And, and I had been sort of vaguely aware of the story when it had been happening a couple of years earlier, and I was still living in the U.S., um, but I hadn't known any of the details of it. Um, and while I was living there, it's, it's sort of, you know, some of the blanks started to get filled in. Uh, but a lot, a lot of the blanks didn't, and a lot of them never really did and never really have. There's just a lot of question marks about what really happened and what she really did or didn't do. And so, you know, that's, that's kind of like catnip to a novelist, you know, a fascinating character and a lot of question marks. And eventually, um, after years of paying attention to this story and all the changes in her situation, um, and in, and in Peru's political situation, um, I just kind of threw up my hands and said, well, I'm, I'm not going to get what I want from the news. So I'm going to have to kind of write my way into it and try to figure it out for myself. 
Wonderful. Very satisfying. <laughs> satisfying to be able to give yourself answers. Well, I mean, they, yeah, sometimes they're fictional answers and they were, and they were hard won. Um, but at least being able to write a story that in, in, in certain ways, in the important ways, I think stayed true, not only to what is known about the, the American character, but more importantly to what was happening in Peru and Peru's political situation at the time and the, the long dirty war that they had uh, endured through the 80s and early 90s, um, like getting that situation right and, and, and honoring the 70,000 people who died in that conflict was really, really important to me, even as I was trying to weave together coherence in something that, you know, in the public accounts of it is a, a, a complete is completely incoherent. Um, so that was, uh, that was a project. Yeah, I wanted to show you this, uh, hang on, this, Lisa Allerton said, powerful. I grew up in Johannesburg in the 70s and 80s. Steve Biko became a rallying cry after his death in the fight against apartheid. Yeah. Yeah, and I, you know, maybe maybe unsurprisingly, I was at that Amnesty International concert in 1986, and I heard Peter Gabriel sing Biko, and it's an incredibly powerful song, and it was a really kind of arresting moment to kind of think about how the whole world had begun to pay attention to the apartheid government in ways that they hadn't before after Biko's death. Uh, and then when Gabriel recorded the song, which I think was maybe in 81 or 82, you know, he brought awareness to, to a lot of people who might not otherwise have known about the story. At the same time, you know, there's always a whiff of ridiculousness about celebrities or rock stars kind of taking on political issues. And I think it's fair to say like, okay, so he sang a great song. Like, did that help anybody? Did that matter? You know, what Leah's saying in the excerpt, if it's, you know, how can, how can something that inspires stone teenagers to hold up cigarette lighters and sing along? Like, is that really um, something that's having a political impact? And I, I just, I don't know the answer to it. Um, so a lot of the story and a lot of the process of writing a novel is kind of replicating that, right? I mean, like, what can a novel do? Um, hopefully it can do something, but I, I don't know if it can. It's interesting. Um, from the audience, Andrew, do you think she was right to do what she did? Well, um, Helen, if you're, if you're, if by she, you mean Laurie Berenson, I just have to turn the question back on you and say, I don't know what she did. Um, what, what is, what, what has always been really frustrating and what eventually led me to write the novel is that there are basically two versions of what happened. There's the government of Peru's version, which said that this American 26 year old American woman who had dropped out of MIT somehow became a sort of soldier of fortune and an international arms dealer and was collaborating with a nearly defunct uh, leftist militant group to start uh, restart a revolution, invade um, Congress, uh, par Peru's Congress building, abduct legislators and, and, and um, negotiate a hostage swap all within a year of entering a country that she'd never been to before for the first time. Um, and, you know, the, the, the sort of gringa mastermind that they portrayed her as has, has always just seemed like a preposterous story to me. On the other hand, um, Berenson's story was that uh, she had rented this gigantic house in a wealthy suburb of Lima and had taken on um, 12 or 13 roommates who um, she had no idea that they were a part of this militant organization. By the way, she says, the militant organization was not a terrorist group, but she had nothing to do with that organization and had no idea that the people living in her house and stockpiling weapons had anything to do with that, terror, with that militant group. She was a, a journalist trying to write stories about politics in Peru and was just, you know, the, the whole thing was a misunderstanding or a, or a um, you know, a case of mistaken identity, which sounds equally preposterous to me. Whatever really happened has never been established. Um, it's obviously somewhere in between those two preposterous extremes. The novel I wrote tries to come up with a story that makes sense, um, but I, I don't know what, what relationship it has to what 
did or didn't happen. Clearly, we all need to buy this novel immediately <laughs> and do Thanks. it through our bookshop link so that Thank my friend you. just gets a little kickback Thank too. And, uh, and so that your local bookstore gets a kickback and then we'll all read it and discuss like what is going to go, what's going to happen next. Um, if we can all get together on the screen, yes, then that was magic. <laughs> then um, let's start. Let's start talking about our theme. Our theme tonight is searching searching for, for safety. safety so so i think um one thing that's really interesting um is that we really let authors choose which salon they want to be in and we give them different options usually and so i guess the curiosity for for me and for milda is what drew you to this particular salon <laughs> Maya, you want to start? Oh, I what Tommy looked like he was about to say something. Oh, yeah. Tommy. Um, <laughs> Tommy. Tommy. Yeah. I, I, yeah, nice switch there, Maya. No. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I don't want to generalize, but I think most parents are always searching for safety for their children, right? Like you're you're more way more vulnerable once you've had kids. Um, your life you hope it has more meaning in some ways <laughs> um, because you're, you're always, I think, thinking about protecting your kids. And a lot of what I write about, like a lot of writers is, you know, the fears that I have and a central fear is, you know, trying to keep them to try to keep them safe. Um, and so that's, I guess, why I was drawn to this. And I think also a lot of my writing has to do with father and son relationships or mother daughter relationships and, um, some of maybe me working out, you know, my own, my own life relationships, uh, kind of, you know, mitigated through the characters. Um, and it's just, I think it's innate, uh, to the relationship between parent and child. Um, me and my wife tell our kids all the time, like our job is to keep you safe. Um, and we feel like, you know, there are other jobs that we have to do with our kids as well, but that for us, that feels like a really primary one. Yeah, it's been a great year for that, huh? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. What about you, Maya? What do you think of this topic? What drew you yeah. To so, um, you know, one thing I think about is that for this, when I was writing this memoir, so you can imagine I was, I was like 32 when I was caring for my mother. It's not something I expected to have to do at that age. My daughter was really young. My mom had been a geriatric psychiatrist who succumbed to dementia. So there was also this like 180, you know, thing of, I was every morning giving her Aricept, which was a medication for which she had run clinical trials. Um, so it was very loaded. And I remember, so I had like no time. I didn't have help. I didn't have a babysitter or a nanny or like someone tell my mom. I was like doing it all not, something I recommend, but, you know, I was just like in this juncture and I was fried and I wrote this memoir in that juncture, like while I was living it. And for me, it was an act of like self protection, um, where writing was a form of, you know, catharsis and like gathering of myself and a coping mechanism and a way of processing everything. And what I found was that like, what seemed like, you know, if I could just like take 10 minutes and hide in a closet and write a little excerpt, that made, even though I was like exhausted and would, you know, part of me just wanted to like go on the couch, but just like doing that restored me. Did you actually and, have to hide in a closet? Like, did you? Yes, did you I did have to. So, what I, I love I these, these are my favorite stories from Pen Prentice Salons is like the crazy ways that people get privacy from their toddlers. It's amazing. Yes. So, what I found was that if I tried to hide in the bathroom, either my daughter or my mother would find me. But a closet, I could have 10 minutes of like, freedom in the closet you hear that out there people who are listening to this on replay this is it hide in the closet <laughs> and also this is by the way for people who have read what we carry it's written with very short chapters like what i read was a chapter 
Um, so often the chapters were just a page. And this is why. It was because I was in crisis and was writing. Um, and of course, later I had to like find a way to organize all of the sort of fragments and create narrative and structure and all of that. But anyway, I think one interesting thing about parenting, I thought going into parenthood that it would be very self-sacrificial and that protection meant like giving myself up for my child. And sometimes we do, but I also think the reverse is true that often when I do things that feel selfish, I'm a much better parent. And I actually don't think I would have, at my first novel I wrote when my daughter was an infant, um, with both of these books, like I think it's not that I wrote them despite my circumstances. I think I wrote them because of my circumstances and they were a reaction to those circumstances. So I think in a way, parenthood can be not, instead of being like an obstacle to the writing, it can be kind of the fodder or catalyst for writing. Sometimes in perverse ways, like sometimes because you're so stressed out that you need an outlet. But truthfully, if I were not a parent, I would often just be like, I think I'd be like sitting on my couch drinking wine and like relaxing, you know? <laughs> I think sometimes it's like the pressure that gets put on the coal that makes the coal, you know, harden and crystallize and transform. Yeah, absolutely. Here's what Ananda has to say about that. I love how this book examines that sacrificial idea. The idea of sacrifice not being necessarily a parent. It's interesting because I did read, I read an essay in something, I think it might have been an electric lit. There was an essay by a, a young Asian woman who declared she was not going to be a mother because she couldn't see herself sacrificing herself, that she wanted to be more selfish than being a mom. And it was kind of like, that's so interesting because I have childless friends who literally said like, I, as a selfish act, I choose not to have children because I want to have my life. And it's like, what a... What a weird thing parenthood is that we can't define it until we have it and that we all think something about it anyway, like whether or not like it's just, and even once you are a parent, you still can't define it. Right. Like it's just an indefinable thing. How philosophical. I think it's your fault for talking about the French philosopher. <laughs> off on this like thought tangents. <laughs> Andrew, you cannot escape. What drew you to searching for safety? Yeah, I've been I've been trying to um, kind of think that through. Um, I, I I think definitely it has something to do with. Um, well, you know, I, I mean, I, I grew up in the New Jersey suburbs. You know, the the kind of the, the, the typical suburbs that it, what do you always hear? You hear you know, great schools, safe neighborhood, right? Um, and then, and then once I left home when I was 18, I lived in, in cities for, for the next, you know, couple of decades, like, you know, in, in Providence, Rhode Island, in San Francisco and Cusco, Peru. And right around the time, so shortly after I started writing this novel, I took a job in Fort Collins, Colorado, which is a, you know, it's a small city, but it's safe neighborhoods, great schools. And this was right around when my son was born. And I had never really seen myself as moving back to, um, a, a, a suburb and that kind of safety. And there, and there are ways that I still feel very ambivalent about it. I mean, it is a wonderful place to raise a child, but it's also extremely sheltered and extremely protected from a lot of what's going on in the world. My, my, my six-year-old is sending me emojis in the chat. So, that. you know, yeah. <laughs> but so this, this character that I was writing about, you know, she's someone who is raised in the suburbs uh, graduates from Stanford has is, is is exquisitely conscious of how sheltered she's been in her entire life, and you know, unlike me, who takes a job in a in a safe suburban town and you know maybe dashes off like polemical letters about politics, like she actually decides to go all in and put her body on the line for what she believes in um, and to fight like in, in literally literally physically fight for what she feels are the moral imperatives. Um, and, and I'm fascinated by that. I mean, in, in, in some ways I'm shamed by that because I, I, I have never done those things. And I came to terms a long time ago with the fact that I'm not a person 
who would have. And so I'm, I'm sort of simultaneously like, like horrified and inspired and confused by, by someone who's able to do that. And so that, so kind of trying to work that out for myself was a lot of what was uh, propelling me as I wrote the book. And I think it's what drew me to the topic for tonight. Wonderful. Thank you. So since, since we're sort of coming out of COVID, right? Like, I don't know about you guys, but my kid is in school finally, and um, I'm still not writing actually. Um, but how is, have you been able to write more? Uh, what's it like for you now? Tommy? <laughs> you want me to go first again? <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, and I might be in a little bit of a different situation just because of running both of the literary magazines, I'm able to stay home now. Um, so my schedule has changed quite a bit um, in the sense that uh, if I was a more rigorously scheduled person, I should have enough time to write every day now. Um, I well, still have should probably, sorry, let me just quick yeah. interrupt because we don't actually know how old any of your kids are. You don't have to tell us anything more than that, but just sort of around how old they are so yeah, that we sure. know sort of where you're coming from. Because yeah. we have people from like babies to grown and flown. So yeah, uh, yeah. my daughter, yeah. my daughter is nine and my son is six. Okay. And yeah. Andrew, you said you have a six-year-old. We've seen the emojis. Yeah, yeah, six. And my daughter is now 12 and a half. The fraction is yeah. incredibly important at this Very, age. At this age. Because <laughs> she is allowed to not say 13. Yeah. yeah. Um, and she's a math person, so she sometimes like calculates it out precisely. And she's now taller than I am. Wow, that's a weird, that's a weird moment. And I'm tall, like I'm not a short person anyway. I'm like having trouble. I didn't expect this to be so hard to process that she's taller than I am. And I was not prepared for it yet. So that has happened. My older son is, my older son, I have two kids and the older one is uh, 20 or 19 now. But he, when he outgrew me, he started putting his head on me. On my, on my head, I'm like that needs to stop. I told her, <laughs> so I bought really high shoes. Yes, I told her, mommy is wearing heels all the time, and the faux hawk is only going to get taller. The other, the other really good line is mechanism. when they say, "Well, you know, I'm taller than you." You say, "Yeah, well, I'm still wiser than you." Yeah. <laughs> Forever. Forever. <laughs> no, super, super crazy. All right, now Tommy, you can finish your story. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So, so yeah, so I um, have been able to transition from being a special education um, middle school teacher to um, working at home and working with writers um, full time um, and also hoping to try to, yeah, get my own writing in there as well. Um, I'm not a, 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 so the kids are at school. Um, my wife is at school. She's a fourth grade teacher. So they go with her uh, every morning. Um, I get up and pack their lunches and, and get them ready to go. And um, that's probably the time that I should write, but I'll tell you, getting all the lunches packed and getting kids off to school in the morning, uh, it can be a little exhausting. <laughs> so, um, so usually I need to take a few minutes after that, but, um, and I'm not a write everyday kind of writer, but there is time um, now. I feel privileged to have that kind of time for sure and humbled by it. Um, so I try to stay true to that. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of stuff that's still... Uh, I think you, I'm working on trying to figure out how to make time for myself because um, editing almost like teaching, like you can always do more and you can always interact more with writers. Um, um, there's always, there's always something to do. So. so. So when you're editing and those of you that are also teachers or have edited, um, does it inspire you to write better or does it inspire you to let it go and let them have spotlights? How do you, like, what yeah, happens to you? I think it's a good question. Um, when I first started writing, like, in undergrad, and even, like, when I was in a MFA, like, I'd have these writers that I loved, and they would be teaching as well. Uh, Charles Baxter would be an example here. And I'd go, well, why isn't Charles Baxter putting out a book every two to three years? Like, I just didn't get it. And then, you know, once I did more teaching, I was doing more teaching, and I was doing more editing. Uh, I think it it's, it's a... Um, it's an energy that I think you're putting out to someone else. Um, and it's also um, staying in that analytical and critical um, space. And for me, I need to switch out of that to get back to the, the playful part of the page. And that's not always possible every day. Um, so I'm very, very excited and honored um, to help other people 
um, you know, put their stories out into the world and helping, especially we're trying really hard to get uh, diverse and underrepresented writers um, uh, out there more, you know, they should have always been. And so we're trying to do that as much as possible. And so like, you know, that's an, an honor for me. Um, but yeah, there are days when I am stuck in that critical analytical mode and I just have to stay in it because um, I, I need to get back to the space. And and one way that I do that is is reading, which I'm sure for most writers, that's how you get back to being inspired. So, um, so it, yeah, it's kind of a full circle kind of thing. Like, yes, it inspires me. Um, yes, sometimes it's hard to turn off the editor brain, um, but but the stories are, are always there, uh, I think, to get me back to, you know, what I fell in love with with writing in the first place, which is just, you know, amazing stories and narrative. So I also, um, I teach fiction and memoir classes, and then I um, am the vice president of editorial and strategy for a brand new publishing company called Zibby Books. Oh, and, um, Zibby Books. Wait, does that have to do with uh, the moms who don't write or something like that? Yeah, moms so Zibby Owens, who has a podcast, she, she was named like a, you know, one of the most powerful like book influencers. She decided to start this publishing company because after having literally over a thousand writers on her podcast, she would talk to authors and hear these like recurring things. And she was basically always puzzling over the question of why it was that often the books that were her favorite books were not the ones that were in the spotlight. They were not the New York Times bestseller. They were not the one at the front table at Barnes and Noble. And she would think, well, like, why is this happening? She started to look into the publishing industry. Um, Anyway, so I'm now part of that enterprise, and so I am editing books and also, you know, sorting through manuscripts and waking up at 4 a.m. to read, and you know, it's a lot. Um, so two analogies I like to make for writing. One is that I think writing, I think it's like um, a welcome thing for me to think of writing as the mistress in life, um, meaning that like when I'm tired and you know, fried and busy, like writing shows up as a welcome thing. Nice. Um, so I kind of let myself, like I sort of let myself get mm -hmm. overworked and busy and I give in to that because I kind of secretly think writing shows up when I'm in that state. And then the other thing, I think of writing as farming in that often there are subterranean things happening that we don't we have no evidence or proof of, we can't see. But I really think times when I've like made myself write and forced myself to write, that often doesn't go so well. And when I just kind of trust that like, you know what, sometimes you just, it's like farming. It can't always be harvest time. And sometimes you just gotta look at a barren field and be like, okay, things are happening underground. I don't see them, but they're happening. Weeding, weeding, more weeding. <laughs> there are times when you weed, there are times when you have to prune and weed and edit, and there are other times when you just have to let ideas germinate um, and I think be patient. And I think that can be a tough part of the process. Oh, yeah. For sure. Andrew? Um, we, Tommy and Maya have been, have been hopscotching um, among some, several really interesting ideas, so I can't remember what the original question was. The original one was just about writing and editing and whether it makes you write better to have all this writing side related stuff or whether it is harder when you're teaching. Yeah, it's, cha it's changing for me. I think, I think earlier in my career, like while I was writing my first two books, um, I always felt really um, enriched and fed by my students. I mean, I, I, I've been teaching creative writing, um, graduate students and undergraduate students for for close to twenty years, and um, and in the beginning, it was it was really um, it, it was it was just it was always adding. Uh, partly just because I, you know, I found being in the conversations with students about what writing is and what we're trying to do, like so inspiring partly because you know i was just privileged enough to be spending a huge amount of my time in communities of writers which not every writer has and also because you know i, I felt like there, there's a lot to be gained by forcing yourself to kind of articulate what it is that's important about the work at a craft level at a thematic level um at a political level um 
lately i feel like um i've i've been a little bit more um uh occasionally resentful of the time that it takes away from the work i think it has less to do with the students than the fact that i'm uh i'm now directing an mfa program at a large public university and you know i, I often joke that working at a public university is not that different from working at the dmv you know it's just like <laughs> An enormous bureaucracy that you know there are days when, when really you just want to smash your head against cinder blocks um, and so all of the admin around that um, uh, you know dealing with the university uh, organizing my colleagues being responsible not only for the students in my class but the students in the whole program has taken up a lot of the bandwidth um, that I really would prefer to be devoting to the writing so I want to flip this on its head and ask you each, what has helped you the most in your writing career? Like, I know, Andrew, you sort of mentioned community slightly, but uh, but what what thing or things or job or moment or what thing has sort of kind of catapulted you a little bit in your where you feel like, yeah, that really like helped me. I'm so glad I did that, like grad school, whatever anything, a publication, what, what was the, the sort of like, oh yeah, I'm okay. Maya looks like she has something she wants to say. I do. Um, I don't know if I read Tommy's face correctly before when I like passed the baton to you. I don't think I did, but you did read my face correctly. So I wanted to quote actually from the comment section, Lara said, parenting can be the fodder or thing that lights the fire because it smacks you right in the face. Yes, it does. With the idea of if not now, than when. It's so totally true. And I had, so my life trajectory was sort of the equivalent of being like in the closet with writing. It was the thing I really, you know, who I am. And I was just so scared to be out there in the world pursuing it. I was just like, oh my God, like you can't actually do that. And it was all of that fear and kind of self-censorship and Anyway, when I, so I did everything but pursue writing, even though that was like what I, what my heart desired and what I so wanted to do. Um, and I was briefly an academic, Andrew, um, so I know that world. You're recovering. <laughs> I, yeah, I describe myself as a recovering academic. Um, but yeah, when I was pregnant, I really had this moment of just being like, what am I doing? Like I'm running and that's so lame. And I just thought, I don't want to ever look at my daughter and tell her, oh, I always wanted to try writing. Mm -hmm. I felt like I don't want to be that person. I want to look her in the eye and be like, I tried and maybe I failed and maybe I never got published or how, yeah, I didn't know how the story would end, but I just thought like exactly what Laura said, like, if not now, when? And I think children have a way of like really holding up a mirror and making you uh, re-examine yourself. So yeah, her arrival was paradoxically um, the thing that uh, helped me most in my writing. Oh, wonderful. wonderful. Me, me, and you're echoing again, so we didn't catch Sorry. that. I have to unplug and replug to get resynced. Um, I just said that we at Pen Parenthesis appreciate that your child was the impetus. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what about you guys? What was the thing, the moment, the, the catalyst? You're not, you don't have to say kid. It's good. It's already been said. Yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah. Tommy, you want to be off the hook and go last on this one? Yeah, I'll go last. Let's okay. Go. All right. Um, yeah, I, I think for me, well, I, I mean, for me, I'll, like the literal answer would, would be boring and kind of obnoxious, which is just, you know, the, I mean, some really phenomenally lucky breaks I got. And was it and because like, you knew people that you had met places? No, or? no, it just, you know, I, I went, I went to a, a, like a, a, an excellent MFA program, got in off the wait list. Right. So oh. in some way I shouldn't have been there. And then, and then I applied for a, a fellowship three or four times and finally snuck in somehow. And, you know, I mean, th th these are sort of boring and obnoxious Tenacity. about my, my privilege as a writer, but I think um, the, the ways, I, I, I think a more interesting 
kind of way of thinking about my own trajectory and like the moment when it became like a real possibility to, to, to make a life of this was, was sort of um, when I started writing what became my first novel. And there was a, a, a there was a kind of, you, you, this was, this was five or six years after graduate school, I had published a couple of stories, but I wasn't really getting anywhere. I didn't have a shot at a job and I was writing stuff that even I recognized was like really boring. Um, and it would have garnered plenty of praise in my workshops and from my teachers, but it was, it was boring. It wasn't doing anything new and it was very, very safe. And I started kicking around some ideas for, for this novel that were like really outlandish and um, not a good idea, you know, <laughs> not a good idea. And, and plenty of people told me like, you're, you're just nuts. Like you can't, write like this and you can't take on this material and you can't do it in this style and you're just gonna like you know this is like artistic suicide <laughs> anyway because it felt really good to be doing it and it felt really liberating and you know then then finally someone was ready to publish a book of mine and and um you know at the, so, so that moment of realizing like oh you know it's it, it's the only reason to do this and the only way to do it is to sort of like really find out who you are and you know i mean i know this is a family program but like f how everybody says you're supposed to write and just do the thing that's like demanding that you do it 100 percent. can i throw in a story that yeah you reminded me of andrew um so my first novel um you know and i didn't know anyone in publishing so it was i totally did the thing of just cold querying. And when I got an agent, it was like so exciting. And then I was like, wait a minute, this doesn't mean that I, it doesn't mean anything. Like I don't have a book deal. Yeah. So then she sent my novel out to publishers and it was unanimously rejected. Like first it was rejected from like the tier one of publishers, then the tier two, then like the smaller publishers, then like the really small publishers. Kinko's said no. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, in there. That X store didn't want it. So when it was like universally rejected, a bunch of the editors said to me, like at different publishing houses, said to me, like, oh, you know, one thing that would help make this novel sellable, which is like the worst word ever, is if you had a romance angle between two of these characters. Oh I, yes. I heard that comment. My novel was a riff on Ulysses. Oh. And I was just like, <laughs> there's no romance here. Like, it was so maddening. And it's exactly what Andrew said. Like, that rejection actually um, made me. So I ended up scrapping the novel, rewriting it. I kept the first sentence and I kept the last sentence and I rewrote everything in between oh, wow. and I doubled down on the lack of romance between these two characters nice. I and mean, one of the characters like asexual just to completely throw that out the window anyway it really made me dig deep and it made me I was like all right if I'm gonna get rejected I want to have this be the ship I sink on you know what I mean like I if I'm gonna get rejected I want to get rejected for the novel I really really want to write and I want to do this my way and and I realized that like that process of getting rejected and also the thing that they were picking up on between those two characters, there was something there. It's just that their suggestion for what to do with that um, sort of amb ambiguity in the novel, they had the incorrect fix. But the thing that they were responding, so often this there is what happened. something there, it just wasn't, the fix, yeah. So yes, over it and not, yeah. Right. So often I think when you get feedback, whether it's in workshop or from an editor or a friend who's reading your book, if they say something like, oh, you know, I, I wasn't sure about this. And I kind of think, I feel like you should tune out whatever their suggestion is and just register. The person is saying something about X. Mm -hmm. That's so smart. Whatever they say and just, and mentally flag, okay, some, I can do something about X. Mm -hmm. And then do that your way in a way that you, that makes you feel like I've done justice to my characters and my book. Um, and when you get that feeling of like, yeah, I'm doing this how I want to do it. 
everything else becomes irrelevant. Like no one is uh, more of a writer than you in that moment. There's no amount of, like success or award or publication. I think to achieve that feeling is everything. That's Great. really smart. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Um, so yeah, mine's kind of a balance between that. It, it does have to do something with grad school. Um, it was the first time, like I didn't start writing as a kid. I, I started my sophomore and junior year of college. Uh, I was going to be a lawyer. And then I took a short story writing class and that was it. Like I was hooked. Um, and so I eventually went to a low residency program and I worked with some really amazing people um, that, that told me that my work, uh, even in its immature state, right at that point, um, had value. Um, and, and that I should, that I should keep going. Um, and, you know, in some ways I needed some of that validation. I didn't have a writing community at that point. Um, you know, my undergrad stuff had, you know, those people had dried up. And so yeah. I was searching for that. And then I also, you know, didn't take, uh, it didn't listen very well. Cause like a lot of writers after my MFA, I, I fell into a funk. Um, and I, I didn't write for almost two years. Um, and, and then I emailed one of those professors um, who said, you need to call me. And I called her and she talked to me for an hour and was like, this is basically like stupid. Like you're wasting your time. <laughs> you're wasting your gift. It doesn't matter what you write. You need to be writing. Like it's, you know, and, and I needed it in my life as well and she just she knew it and and then sometime after that i think i had a conversation with my wife and i was like hey what if i only write flash fiction and she was like yeah what if you only write flash fiction like that's okay like you don't have to write a novel and like i still want to write a novel but also like that pressure kind of came off my shoulders like like you know I feel like I'm really good at writing flash. Um, and it's something that I not only feel comfortable in, but also feel challenged in. Um, and it's just the way that I, I, I guess I see the world and the way I see my writing. Um, so I try to, you know, not take that for granted at this point. Um, yeah. So that's kind of it. I think it's like you said, like um, forget about what other people want you to write. Um, and I think it's a really hard thing to learn. And I think I'm still working on that. <laughs> um, and I love what my, what you said about like, if I'm going to get rejected, I want it to be for this, this book. Uh, I'm going to walk away tonight, like taking that with me. Like that's my new torch. Um, so yeah, yeah. Thank you. Oh, just like, you know, it's just the same thing that kind of Andrew said too, that this is a family program, but like, just, you know, F it. <laughs> it's really not a family program. Yeah. Only Andrew's <laughs> child good. happens to be watching. But <laughs> normally, like, no, nobody has the patience to watch an entire Zoom of authors. That's right. <laughs> right. <old>. Uh, and <laughs> I think it's your dad that's on the screen. Right. <laughs> and we talked about patience, too. And I think that's something that you just have to learn and that I'm still learning. Because I just wanted to, you know, take the literary world by fire. But I didn't have those skills yet. Um, and, and, and I just wanted to rush everything. Um, yeah. and I'm finally getting to the point where like, you know, publishing four of my very best stories of the year versus 30 is, is better. And, in, 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 in a lot of ways, um, just because, you know, like, I don't know, you just do better with those four stories, I guess. Um, if they're really true and honest and your really best work, I guess. Yeah. I love well, the idea of just pushing to your, to your highest talent when it's hard yeah what were you going to say andrew did you want to say something uh, well i was just going to also respond to to tommy talking about um talking about genre also and i think that, that one of the things that can be really deadening or restricting for writers is the kind of the kind of received hierarchies of genre that we're all taught um there's fiction there's poetry there's something called creative nonfiction and each of those have sort of subdivisions and if and you're and you're writing one kind of thing and not another kind of thing and each of them have their rules and you know there are there are lots of reasons why we've received these categories you know the role of academia in dividing up curricula the publishing industry and the book selling industry having to you know label their shelves this is the poetry section and whatnot but but you know the, the, it's 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 BS in a lot of ways, and you know one of the things I really enjoy about the program I work in at Colorado State University is that a lot of the writers who uh, who I work with, my colleagues, are 
they're not only are they multi-genre authors who you know have published in more than one of these, but 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 they're we're also doing a lot of work that's just breaking down these notions of genre at all and saying like you know right writing is the art of words on a page right and artists are going to come at that good artists are going to come at that in new ways and it may or may not conform to what anybody thinks a novel is or isn't supposed to be or a poem is or isn't supposed to be and sort of realizing like how much of this is is just kind of received wisdom that we can discard i think is also extremely liberating and, and like tommy said like i don't I don't need to be a novelist and maybe you will write a novel, but a lot of your energy for the last many years has been writing flash fiction, which I adore flash fiction. And that's at the moment, the writer that you are. And like, that's what you got to do. Thank you. (laughs) you. Yeah. So you guys, I hate to say this, but we are coming, we are well over time, but this has been so, so fascinating and wonderful. And uh, I want all of you people out in viewing land to know that Penparentis is here for you. Uh, we do have accountability meetups for writer parents. Go to penparentis.org to find out more about becoming a title member and you can join our accountability meetups. And then these salons are free to you once a month. And you're always welcome to come and see our salons. The next one is November 9th. It is with Amy Shern, Sarah Schaff, and Jotham Borelio. And uh, what's the theme, Christina, for next? Next, it's have and have to, the it? have and have nots. The have and have nots. So we hope to see you all back here at seven o'clock Eastern time on um, on what on November the 9th. And I want to thank Tommy and Andrew and Maya for their time. And everybody, let's let's give everybody a round of applause. Thank you so, so much for coming. Bye, everyone.